Welcome to our latest opponent preview, and I'm pleased to be joined by Henry Greenstein, the sports editor and also beat writer uh, for uh, of the Kansas Jayhawks for the Lawrence Journal World and KUSports.com. Is that correct? That's right. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I'm glad you're joining me. Uh, this is year number two for you uh, covering the Jayhawks, uh, but uh, you have good perspective because um, not only have you covered the Big 12 for a year, uh, but you got your master's at Arizona State, so you know a little bit about Pac-12. And you told me you grew up in Los Angeles, so you know a lot about Pac-12, right? Yeah, and and as a result, I, I welcome the introduction of all these schools into the Big 12. Um, I, I feel like I'm I'm on home turf in a couple of different ways as a result. Well, first off, how weird is it for you to see Arizona State, uh, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah in the Big 12? Well, I think it varies from school to school because for you, it's probably not weird at all. I mean, yeah. Colorado being in the Big 12, I think, is, is a very natural fit. And that was the one that made the most sense to me. But I think the Four Corners schools overall are are, are good additions in terms of regional footprint. They don't they don't push the conference too, too far afield. It, it all makes a relative amount of sense to me. It, what's a lot more difficult for me is as someone who grew up a Cal fan uh, is to see them in the ACC, but we don't have yeah. to get into that because that is one of the most, <laughs> one of the most grotesque examples of conference realignment. Right. Well, and, and Kansas certainly belongs in the big 12. They've been in the big eight, seven, 12, you know, for a very long time. So, uh, yeah. and, and you mentioned to me, you know, before we started here, you, you started uh, uh, in, in uh, Lawrence in May of 23 or March. May, yeah. May, May of 23. So uh, a very good time to start covering Kansas football. It's, it hasn't been a very good time covering Kansas football uh, for much of the previous 15 years before that, sort of like covering Colorado football, but uh, you <laughs> came in at a good time. And so uh, just let me just start there. What's the vibe around, you know, from fans and, and things like that around this team that you know, it was finally starting to taste some winning? You know, it's funny because last year around this time, everything I was writing of was like, was like, these are the greatest expectations that the Kansas football program has ever known, at least since the Orange Bowl. No one has, has in recent memory, thought that KU would be at this level. And now somehow they're even higher entering this year. Uh, and that's for a couple of different reasons. I mean, yeah. you're coming off a bowl win, but they have 30 seniors this year. There's kind of a do or die sense to it. Basically, everyone who contributed to uh, the program's uh, rise through the Big 12 ranks, at least in terms of players, uh, is leaving after this year. So. Uh, this is an essential season for a lot of people involved. Uh, it, it could be a redemptive season for Jalen Daniels after he missed almost all of last year. And he's kind of the central figure around this whole team revolves in some ways. So, um, the, yeah, incredibly high expectations. And another element that plays into that is that KU has a pretty easy schedule in terms of who they drew in the Big 12. Yeah. They don't play they are they, they don't play Utah, Arizona or Oklahoma State. Um, and, and that benefits them tremendously. And that's part of why a lot of odds and stuff have them as one of the top conference title contenders. It's not necessarily because they are one of the best teams in the league, although that may prove to be the case. I mean, I think they ended up fourth in the in the preseason poll and got a few first place votes. But the reason why expectations are so high is because there's a path where it looks like, all right, yeah, they didn't really do this. Yeah, you know, I was looking at the same thing when I looked at, you know, you know Colorado has to play all five of the teams that are in the top five of the preseason poll. And I'm looking at all these other teams like Kansas has one of them and it's Kansas state, you know, so it's a rivalry game. And so, uh, yeah, Kansas sort certainly, uh, drew the, the right end of the stick there, uh, on the schedule, but on the flip yeah. side of that, they also don't get to play any games in Lawrence. Um, you know, they're going to play, uh, all their home games in Kansas city. Uh, how big of a factor is that? Do you think, I mean, you know, I don't know what the, I, I've, I've been to Lawrence, you know, I, I covered a game there in 2010, uh, which was a horrible game for Colorado, uh, a very memorable game for Kansas. I don't know if you know about this one, but uh, Colorado was up 45 to 17 with 12 yeah. minutes left and Kansas won the game and my fans don't need to revisit that. So we'll move on. But um, so I've been there, I don't, but I, I don't know what the home field advantage is like for them. So what kind of a factor is it that they don't get to play any games in Lawrence this year? Yeah, it, it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, for one thing, there was originally supposed to be a plan where they would play games at the under construction stadium, which if you've seen pictures of what the stadium looks like now, is just an unbelievable thought because it's yeah. impossible to imagine that would have worked. And sure enough, they decided not to do it because they eventually came to the realization if we play a game here that sets back our construction timeline considerably. Um, and if we play six games here, that's six times as much setback. So 
KU has not been known for having great attendance over the years. The, the last couple seasons, because they've gotten off to hot starts and there's been more excitement around the program, they've managed to sell out a few games. Um, but, you know, it's not a team in the Big 12 that's known for having the most dominant home field advantage. It's not like going to Jack Trice Stadium or something where you know that's going to be a tough place to win on a Saturday night. Yeah. Um, they certainly improved, like they have a good record at home, um, but still it doesn't have that reputation. So. I think they're at a point in their trajectory where they can feel like they're not losing a huge amount um, by playing games in Kansas City. And for the players, I mean, they're super excited about it. I mean, getting to play in an NFL stadium is something not a lot of college players get to do, uh, unless you happen to be one of the teams that shares your home venue with an NFL stadium, and then it's probably yeah. not that special at all. Um, but, you know, K is playing all four of its, con of its conference games, including the one against Colorado at Arrowhead. It remains to be seen just how well they do at filling up those stadiums. Uh, again, not a team that's had a huge amount of sellouts. They've done the best they can by implementing like free student busing programs and stuff. I suspect that Iowa State and Colorado will be the most richly attended games because they'll get large contingents of away fans, you'd have to think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, kind of a mixed bag overall. Last night was their first practice at Children's Mercy Park, the soccer stadium where they're playing their uh, their first two non-conference games against Lindenwood and UNLV. And we got to go out there and see it. And it, it's not a facility that's played host to a huge amount of football. I mean, besides the Division II national title games in the mid 2010s, uh, it, it's kind of a new thing for that venue, much more so than Arrowhead. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it's intimate. It'll produce a good home field advantage, opposite of Arrowhead in many ways. And I'm just really interested to see how this all unfolds. And I think many people are grateful. This is something they only have to deal with in one year, but it'll certainly be an interesting one year experiment. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I guess one thing, uh, maybe advantage Kansas is by the time CU gets there, Kansas will have played a few games at Arrowhead already. And so it's not going to be a new thing. I'd almost rather, if I'm the opponent, get Kansas that first time they play at Arrowhead uh, to where maybe um, it's new to everybody. But uh, it'll be interesting to see that. But uh, with Kansas, I mean, people have got to like this team. And, uh, you know, Lance Leopold still staying at Kansas and getting a new contract. How big of a deal is that? And and are you surprised that uh, they, they were able to keep him? I'm not super surprised because I know that he's committed to being a program builder. And that's kind of what he demonstrated at Wisconsin Whitewater uh, in the earlier stages of his career. But it's a great accomplishment, especially when you consider all the rumors or that, that Washington was after him for their job. And that was a team that was in the national title game. Uh, so it speaks very well of his commitment that he's still here. Um, but yeah, I mean, to answer your initial question, obviously a massive deal. As the Mark Mangino era and its aftermath demonstrated, there is no guarantee of consistent success at Kansas when you move from one coach to another. Yeah. Um, part of what has made Lance Leipold's time special is that he's he's helped encourage material steps like the stadium and facility upgrades they've had, which to me kind of raise the floor of the program, you'd think. Like, because they have these new selling points they didn't have before, um, they they can't possibly go back to what they were like from 2010 to 2020, basically, um, 2021 even. Uh, but with all that in mind, I think that whenever in, at some far-flung date in the future there is another coach other than Lance Leipold, it's hard to imagine KU could sink as low as it did in the post-Mangino era because the impact that he's made has substantively shifted, like I said, the baseline of this program in a way that I don't know that any other coach managed to in that intervening period. Yeah, you know, and I know that it was some rough years and, you know, Colorado, you know, caught Kansas at the start of that. Um, it's been rough for Colorado, you know, I mean, both these teams, you know, you kind of watch over the years, they've sort of been uh, in some ways mirrored each other in some ways and, and that, you know, they've really struggled with success and, and finding it. But last year, you know, Kansas first winning season since 2008. Uh, and they did it, like you mentioned, without Jalen Daniels, who uh, was injured most of the year. And now he's back. He's such a good player when healthy, but he's missed so many games. Uh, how big of a key is it for him to be healthy? I, I don't know if Kansas has the same type of backup they had last year. Yeah, you, you almost forget because you go so long without seeing him because, you know, like last year, when he made his debut in week two, he had also missed a a lot of time in the middle of 2022 with a shoulder injury. So over the last couple of seasons, his, his appearances, have, he's played basically one full season across the last two. Um, but yeah, I mean, he escapes the pocket so well. He's got a great arm. He makes good decisions. Um, he's unpredictable. 
he can be the key to this team reaching its full potential, absolutely. And as you alluded to, with Bean gone, they have Cole Ballard, who started his career as a freshman walk-on last year and was thrust into action when Bean also got hurt with a head injury against Texas Tech. And Ballard ended up having to start the Sunflower showdown against K-State. And if not for a dropped interception, blocked extra point return for a defensive conversion, muffed punt, if any of those three things hadn't happened, Cole Ballard wins the Sunflower showdown for the first time in a decade and a half. So clearly yeah. a guy who can put them in positions to win, but I don't know. Ballard's really aggressive. He's really inexperienced. He has more developing to do. And if you're a KU fan, you just hope he doesn't have to do that developing on the field. Yeah, and, you know, frankly, it'd be nice to see Jalen Daniels have a healthy full season because, you know, he deserves it. You know, he's been such a good player and a key player for Candace's rise that you'd like to see him, uh, you know, have that full season, right? Oh, for sure. I, I think everybody would like to. I, I think he had a really tough time with the injury. Everyone questioning if he was going to transfer, if he was even going to come back to KU to begin mm-hmm. with. I mean, you know, like last fall, if, if I went on like a, a road team's local market radio show or something, I that's what I'd be immediately asked about. Like, is it true? Is there really any chance he's going to go? And there wasn't. And as he said this this summer, he never really had any intention of doing that. But yeah, I I I, I think everyone hopes that he can play this season as much as possible without having a cloud of some kind hanging over him. Yeah. Well, he's certainly got some weapons around him. Devin Neal being one of them, uh, you know, one of the top running backs in a, in a very running back loaded big 12, you know, Devin Neal's one of them. Um, how, how big of a key is he? Oh, I mean, he's, he's probably the most beloved player locally because he's from here. He's from Warren. Mm-hmm. So everyone has a special connection to him in that respect. He bet on the program when it was at his lowest and, has uh, played a great role in getting it to where it is now. He also is 765 yards away from becoming the all-time leading rusher. Mm -hmm. Um, So could have a chance to leave his mark on the program that way. The interesting balance you got to get with Neil is giving him as many carries as possible without wearing him down because you also have other great backs at your disposal, particularly Daniel Highshot Jr., who for much of the beginning of last season, it was kind of like a thunder and lightning thing. And then Highshot really slowed down in in the latter half um, and he's another guy who's dealt with injuries, Highshaw. So uh, his ability to put together a complete season and therefore make things easier on, on Devin Neal uh, will be important. And as important as Neal is, I think the wide receiver group at KU doesn't doesn't get a lot of attention. But it's basically the same three guys who have been starting since 2022 and in some cases 2021. And they all have great rapport uh, with Jalen. So even though they don't leap off the page, they're not really seen as marquee NFL draft prospects, Lawrence Arnold, Luke Grimm, and Quentin Skinner will also be important, particularly because KU doesn't really have a, a bona fide starting tight end at this point. Yeah. How are they in the trenches? Offense and defensive lines? Pretty good. I would say worse than last year, mm-hmm. um, just in, in select ways. For one thing, you lose your best offensive lineman and your best defensive lineman of the NFL draft. Um, Dominic Pooney ran out of eligibility. He was their left tackle last year. He got drafted in the third round by the 49ers, which made him the highest drafted KU player since 2008. So that's a sign of the progress. Um, And Austin Booker, who we've already seen this preseason in the Hall of Fame game, he went in the fifth round to the Chicago Bears. So the, the, the Pooney one, they have enough people to shore up the offensive line. Logan Brown, who was a highly touted trainer from Wisconsin earlier in his career, he dealt with injury, but he seems poised to slide in and be the left tackle. They also lost their center, Mike Nowitzki, who signed with the Seahawks as an undrafted free agent. But in mid-June, at a startlingly late period in the transfer cycle, they got Bryce Foster from Texas A&M, a former freshman All-American. So that made the offensive line picture look particularly good because they have some returning starters as well. The defensive line, though, might be the greatest source of uncertainty in the entire roster. I mentioned tight end earlier, and between pass rush defensive end and tight end, those are the, the two most peculiar spots they find themselves in because with Booker gone you're basically trying to choose between Dean Miller who was a Juco transfer from College of the Canyons who has mostly played special teams and hasn't been able to keep weight on for most of his college career but is now doing a somewhat better job with that that's the number one choice for pass rush defensive end by Job who was the top player in Oklahoma out of the 2023 class and transferred from Michigan State this offseason And then two true freshmen in DJ Warner and Dak Brinkley, who 
are among the highest touted recruits that KU has brought in in quite some time for any position, yeah. but it's not clear whether they'll, be, whether they'll be able to contribute as true freshmen. So that position stands out because strong side defensive end, they have two really experienced guys, Jeremy Robinson and Dylan Woodkey, and defensive tackle, three, four guys who all fit the same mold. So they'll be pretty good in the trenches overall, but I do think it's a little bit worse than last year. Okay. Well, I know they can cover because they got a couple of the best uh, corners in the Big 12. Um, yeah. you know, Kobe Bryant, Melo Dotson, um, you know, those guys have, uh, it seems like they've been uh, playing for a little while. Kobe, I think, has been all Big 12 for a couple years in a row. Um, you know, how how big is that secondary and, and that pass defense? Yeah, well, they can they can thrive for sure as long as as long as KU is able to get a pass rush to uh, to yeah. take some of the heat off them. But yeah, Kobe Bryant's the one you hear more about. Um, he's got the more outgoing personality. He has the more national prominence. But over the course, and he barely got targeted all of last year. But that's part of why Mel Dotson was able to shine because everyone was throwing at him all the time. Yeah. Um, and he had two really important pick sixes: one against Oklahoma and one against Iowa State in consecutive weeks. Um, that led to KU really putting itself in position to get those wins. Um, so he's got more of a name for himself, and that's how they both end up on the preseason all-conference team uh, this year. And, you know, talking to Kobe Bryant the other day, he basically says, he basically said, like, well, I don't think they're going to want to throw up Melo either this year, so they'll have no choice but to run the ball against us. We'll see if that proves to be the case in theory. KU's run defense hasn't been that great, so I would, I would definitely imagine that could happen. Um, but yeah, those two guys are, are are very experienced and very competent, and so are the safeties. The question is kind of who's behind them at cornerback because they lost their two their third and fourth cornerbacks to graduation. But certainly, like in in base defense or whatever, you're feeling pretty good about about your coverage. Yeah, well, I know Shadour Sanders is going to throw the football against them because he loves to throw the ball and he's got great weapons. So that's going to be a fun matchup between yeah. um, Shadour and those receivers and uh, and the corners at, at Kansas. So it um, should be a fun game. Uh, so as, as we wrap it up, I mean, what uh, what do you expect from this Kansas team? I mean, nine and four last year, is that correct? Uh, you know, and, you know, first winning season in a while. Can they be in the Big 12 title game? I mean, what, what are you expecting out of this team? I, I think they can. I think they're a, they're a fringe contender. I'm not sure I would say that on paper they're one of the two best teams in the Big 12, but as I said, the schedule puts them in a in a fortuitous position to have one of the two best records at the end of the year. I would say I expect nine or ten wins uh, in the regular season as of now. I think that winning on the road at K-State is going to be extremely difficult, yeah. uh, as it has been for quite some time for KU. And I think that um, it's quite possible – that as they did at times last year, they'll drop some other games they're expected to win. The Texas Tech one was kind of the main example of that last year, and that was in part because Bean got hurt, and then because they did a halfback pass on third and goal. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I I think that they are in position to for sure only have like two three conference losses. Whether that's enough to put them in title game contention is another matter entirely. But I do expect them to be among the class of the Big Twelve this year, and I don't think that. That's been expected of Kansas in any other year since probably entering 2009 when they yeah. when they turned out not to be. So, yeah, well, the Kansas, the days of Kansas being that easy win, the one that you just mark in. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're, we're going to win that one. Uh, those, those days are over. So, you know, that'll be a fun game uh, when the Buffs get out there in November. And uh, Henry, I look forward to seeing you out there. And, and thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm looking forward to that game. I'm sure the players are too, because everyone's excited about playing Colorado this year. Not because they think it's going to be easier, because they know that there's a national spotlight attached to it. So it will be a, it'll be a fun game. And yeah, looking forward to it. Awesome. I'll see you out there.